You're listening to the Goop Podcast, made possible by our friends at Blue Diamond. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in today. This podcast is a real passion project for us at Goop. Twice a week, we sit down with a guest who has the potential to change the way we look at the world. You'll hear a lot from my chief content officer, Elise Lunin, who's incredibly curious and brilliant. And you'll hear from me, of course. Today, I'm talking to Dax Shepard. Dax is an actor, writer, director, and the host of his own compelling podcast show called Armchair Expert. I had a fantastic time recording at Dax's studio, and I think it's safe to say we covered a lot of ground. We talked about relationship challenges, intimacy, marriage, and raising kids. We talked about self-esteem and things that we find triggering. We talked about fame, and we talked about making mistakes, getting vulnerable, and what we learned in the process. I feel this deep obligation to go like, oh, God, by the way, it takes a shitload of work. It's not easy. It's it's not. I didn't find the one. I found someone I respected, and we made it the one. We'll get to it in just a minute. I'm always curious about what routines successful people follow, beginning with how they start their day. Our beauty team at Goop runs an editorial feature called My Morning Routine, where they ask people both inside and outside the company how they get going every day. They just interviewed our fashion editor, Eileen, for the column. In addition to being a great fashion editor, Eileen is currently the cutest pregnant woman ever. And when you see Eileen's glowy skin, you want to know what she does to take care of it. Part of her routine is snacking on almonds during the day. She goes for Blue Diamond Whole Natural Almonds. They're non-parel, supreme almonds, an excellent source of vitamin E, which may support healthy skin. To see Eileen's morning routine with Blue Diamond Whole Natural Almonds, Go to coop.com. Let's get to Dax. Monica came to us by way of initially babysitting, then kind of full-time nannying, then starting to manage Kristen's schedule, then realizing she's a brilliant writer, then writing everything for Kristen, then like oh my God, every oh award God. show that Kristen hosts, Monica writes. She's an incredible writer. Oh that my God. We've become partner. Now she just... Completely runs, runs our runs entire life. Yeah. It's fun. We're all, we're in a very bizarre three way marriage. marriage. <laughs> um, there's a parental. We we, we trade we're off all being each other's, other's moms and, and dads babies. and babies. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Talk but, about a modern family. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would it like mirrors what I imagine like a, a, a an Israeli kibbutz does or something sure. like some kind of a communal living situation where. <laughs> Who knows who's doing what? Does that appeal to you at all? It's very scintillating. It <laughs> is, right? And a lot of levels. Because no one's in the mood at all times to play their role, right? Yeah. Like, isn't, aren't no. there days for you that you're like, I don't, I'm not, I don't be a mom this moment. Let someone else do this. Yeah. I think it happens to the best of us. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds good to me. You're sounding good. Very thinly socially, like we've had maybe six or seven conversations. But impactful ones, at least for me. That's <laughs> what I want to get into. But as luck would have it or not have it, I had a couple toes removed uh, <laughs> but thir 24 hours ago. Oh, my God. And so I'm not at my best. I was late. Let me own that. I was late, which is humiliating. I arrived on crutches. I just took some medication that I had, I don't get to use because I'm sober, so I'm probably going to zone out <laughs> about nine minutes into this. So just... I want to make a lot yeah. of apologies going into this. Okay, you, right. you've set the tone. <laughs> also, you you drove out here, which is a big thing for us in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually really, it's weird. I think when I've got so many, I've got so much happening in my life that I'm sort of now welcoming. If I have to get in the car, I can listen to a podcast. Oh, yeah. I can call people. It's kind of like this beautiful respite in the day so i don't mind it's you it sounds to me like you've done what i do with flights to new york like to me a flight to new york is a vacation yes. like five hours where no one can call me or ask me to get them anything i can lay flat and watch movies <laughs> yeah that's heaven so you've kind of yeah. transposed that onto just the la commute yeah Good so I'm, i and i and i love this neighborhood and i i don't I, get here very often i saw you in traffic about um nine months ago and i found <laughs> 
myself kind of waving embarrassingly. It was on Fountain. Really? I swear to God, this happened. Oh and, my God. and you were up high. You were a passenger in someone's vehicle, an SUV. I know exactly what it was because I'm a car nut, but it was someone's G Wagon. And you were very elevated in the air. And I could see you quite clearly. And I did some spastic waving and stuff. And of course, you didn't see me. Darn. And then I had that like two minutes of mild embarrassment Shame. about the whole thing. Yeah. I would have been very happy to see you. <laughs> to wave back. <laughs> yes. Isn't it scary that people see us while we're in the car? Mm -hmm. I always forget that. And I'm always doing who knows what. Picking your nose. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I do a Singing lot of Singing with great fervor exactly. along to some. There, there is something that happens in the car that it elevates my, I won't, I won't speak for you, but my own self-esteem where I do, I sing and I dance incredibly loud and I convince I sound fantastic <laughs> and I can get into a zone where I'm the person I really fantasized about being. What does Kristen Bell think of your singing? Well, it's just yesterday. She, well, she describes me as tone deaf. Ah, so say no more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a very efficient summation of <laughs> how she feels about my singing, but but I sing a lot. And what's ironic is she's a beautiful singer. Oh, we know. Yeah, we know. It's been proven. We love her mm -hmm. singing. There's very little singing around the house, and and then yet, yet I am always singing. You're just letting it happen. ABS always be singing. <laughs> Did you wait? Are you a good singer? I would imagine you can sing. I think I'm an okay singer. An okay singer. Yeah. And now, when you were married to Chris, did you find that like you felt left out of the party, like that the, the they, singing party? Yeah. No, because I'm a really, really good harmonizer. Oh. So I never want to be the person singing by myself. I want to be in the back harmonizing, mm -hmm. and so that was a really fun part of being married to him was getting to harmonize with him and. Yeah. You know, suggest little harmonies for songs and stuff. Not verbally, but just sort of, you know, you know, sing along. And then he'd be like, oh, great. I'm going to steal that. Every now and then there's we have these unique opportunities to ju kind of join other people's lives. That would have taken a whole life of dedication to get to. Yeah. W one of them for me is like I did a couple USO tours in Afghanistan. And while I'm like, I was on the helicopter as mm -hmm. they're shooting at something. And I'm like, oh, I kind of teleported into this. Other experience life. that you wow. normally would have to dedicate your whole life to to have experienced right and it's so unique and yeah. i'd imagine being like on the inside of coldplay is one of those where it's like oh i get to be on the inside of coldplay but i didn't uh, yeah it's i mean i'm still with him a lot we raise kids together obviously and we're very good friends he really is like family to me yeah and i always love being around his music and when he's creating music and over all those years we lived in the same house, you know, you definitely get to be privy to some pretty inspired moments. I remember this one time, like we'd put the kids to bed and I had made dinner and it was like a regular night. We just ate dinner and he just got this weird look in his eye. And then he's like, I got to go to the piano. And literally, I'm not kidding, like maybe four minutes later, the song Paradise was done it had oh just like my God. come out like start to finish para, para, oh paradise. Oh. that's not toned up that's perfect here it, yeah. oh, oh, oh that one fucking got me that one got me big time he's <laughs> a great one. they have had several that really got me in a chokehold yellow, yellow for me yeah yeah that was a good one isn't it awesome how me like a couple can own a song? They can just decide it's theirs, which yeah. in, and probably sixteen million people around the world have made it theirs. But it's so nice, like at at a Coldplay concert or at any concert for that matter, you can spot what those songs are, and people go from looking towards the stage, they pivot towards each oh, other. Yeah. I love that moment. It's that really beautiful. So sweet. Are you like a romantic at heart as a kid? Where you, did you? Yeah. Very. Yeah. Me, me too. Very. And did you, in high school, what were some of those albums? In high school, that one? I loved, God, you know, it's funny because I was very into like that or that like British kind of 
alternative 80s music like New, New Order. Wave? Oh, I love New Order. And, you know. Psychedelic Furs. Psychedelic O-N-D. Furs are like, I still, Ghost in You is one of my favorite songs. Can I tell you the best thing that ever happened in my life? I lost my virginity <laughs> intentionally to Love My Way by Psychedelic Furs. Oh my Fur. God, that is the best story. <laughs> in the basement of it's my so house. It's so John Hughesian. Yeah, it was. The unfortunate part of it was I mapped it out pretty nicely. It was a mixtape, a 90-minute tape. And we <laughs> luckily got right to the action, right as Love My Way started, which was my all-time favorite song. And Gwyneth, I did not make it to the chorus. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't expect you to. <laughs> well, I don't think either. I didn't make it to the chorus. And then I was just very confused about, like, do I guess I just continue on with this motion? And like, maybe she'll tell me that that's enough. And then just so going from like maybe the nicest moment to today to my life to then just real confusion and like hoping that I would somehow dematerialize and just end up somewhere I felt normal and and it's all part of the process (laughs) it is isn't it yeah it's so weird how your brain can go from like it has perfect direction for me it's like singular focus direction and then within a a literal second confusion I'm lost yeah that's the human experience yeah right there it's all of us multiple times a day uh like we could be 15 and losing our virginity or yeah you know whatever I just found out I was 15 first let me start were by you saying, 15 I no, guess I was I was terribly young I am almost as it feels what? irresponsible how young were you I was in seventh grade and she was in ninth grade so I was 12 or 13 is that anatomically possible it is I was also 5'11 at in you were in seventh grade. Oh my! My son is in seventh. You're giving me a, a it's not. Panic it's, it's, it's not. A panic. It's not I common. Mean, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's statistically common. no. Who has sex in seventh yeah, grade? Yeah, that's early. I was ready to do it. I can't believe you could get a boner in seventh. Oh, grade. I was. He's been getting boners I was since two, he was four. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I was two years into having boners that I knew what they were intended for. I think for me, it started in sixth grade, where I was like, "Oh, okay. this, this, this is, is making... too close to my life right now. I, yeah. I don't think I can talk yeah, about it." That's yeah it's funny because i tell myself i have a a narrative i'm spinning about how i'm going to be as a father of two daughters yeah and with some awareness that it it is that it's a theory and then in practice it might evolve but currently i'm of the opinion i'm super pro sex i am i am anti having sex to get approval i'm anti having sex to get someone to like you or to gain status in a social circle but if my daughters are horny and they have decided they want to have sex, I'm very pro-sex. Yes, I am too. How do you, as a father, are you intentionally modeling something for them? How do you approach building self-esteem in two young girls? I have a vi- I mean... Because I should just say, I, you're a really thoughtful father. Like, we've had a couple of conversations around it. And I'm always so impressed with how intentional you are in your parenting. That makes me really happy. It's true. Because I'd say the single biggest stream in the leading to the self-esteem pond is the parenting one. I mean, right. it's the one that gives me the most joy, pride, frustration. Especially the daddy one for a girl. Yes. Oh, my God. I don't even know where to start with you. I'm already panicking that we don't have enough time. Because I just want to quickly say to you. <laughs> so much time. That I love when you're on Howard Stern. I think you're an amazing oh, Stern nice. guest. I think you've, have you done it twice. I have. That's yeah. so nice. I want to say I sent you an email one time after your first interview on mm. there. Or maybe I just said it to you in passing, which was the way you described your father on the show as I'm driving to the sand dunes with doom buggies in a trailer behind me. I'm fucking crying. <laughs> The way you talk about your dad. And I either emailed you or I told you in person when I saw you. Like, my life goal is to have my girls talk about me the way you talk about your dad someday. I think your comment was, everyone has a father, but very few people get a daddy. Oh, Oh, my fucking God. I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) I, You know what? That's, I stole the Chris Rock. That's what Chris Rock emailed me when my father died. Oh. Yeah. He just nailed it. Oh, that's mm. so special. I know. I have that towards my mom. That's Look, so I nice. just cannot get enough of that lady. Oh, that's and I so will feel heaven. directionless, I think, when she dies for a while. I'm pretty certain. I can tell you that's 
probably right. <laughs> I can tell you that is your, in your future. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt, you know, for me personally, when my dad died, I mean, I was 30, which is relatively very young, hopefully in the span of my life. And I still have a really, I still have a really hard time with it. And it's so interesting because again, and then I want to get back to, yeah, 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 yeah. but like, I promise I will not. He obey. was so such an intentional father and he was so observant and so deeply supportive and set us up to win all the time. And now I have a 14 year old daughter and a 12 year old son. And I'm like, fuck, I need to call my dad. Like I need to talk to my dad Mm. and I don't have that person. You know, I don't, I have incredibly brilliant people in my lives, but I don't have their grandfather who was also the greatest father in the world. You know, it's like, I need to talk to him. Yeah. And it's... And how old was he when he died? 58. Ay, ay, ay. It's too young. My dad was 62, and these are not good ages. It's way too young. <laughs> Did he have a heart issue or no, something? No, he had had throat cancer, and uh, then we were on a trip to Italy for my 30th birthday, and he just, like, he wasn't feeling well, and then he got double pneumonia, and, like... Oh, my goodness. He just sort of died on me on oh the trip. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. On your birthday, just after, yeah, Oof. it was. So, are you in general now pretty pumped about your birthday as it rolls around? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that, you know, because I, for years, I would go into kind of the deepest depression of all time around my birthday, and then I thought, like, I've got to reframe this somehow. Like, I, my father would not want this for yes. me it would break his heart to know he was yeah. making you sad right and so this past my birthday is september 27th and so this past september i got married on the 29th of september oh what a great way to yeah reclaim it yeah and we got married his ashes are buried under this beautiful tree and at my house and we got married there like yeah. right right near my dad kind of on my dad that sounds <laughs> weird but... <laughs> that's really sweet that yeah i have found myself over the years not even because you and i are friends but because i recognize i feel like where it's coming from i've always felt very defensive of you <laughs> because you you seem to trigger people yeah you trigger people and it drives me bonkers. It really drives me bonkers because I think because in sobriety, our main focus is really kind of isolating. What are our fears? Mm-hmm. Because our fears are, are basically driving this ship. And until yeah. you understand what you're afraid of, you're not going to understand wh- what course you're on, right? Mm-hmm. So when I see someone that's mad at you, to me it seems so obvious. Oh, there's something about her that when they look at her, they feel less than, mm-hmm. which is their issue... And, and a sad issue, a terribly sad issue for that person. But there have been a couple things over the years where I'm like, you guys are so mad she said this <laughs> conscious uncoupling. That was a, that became a firestorm, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what is, why is everyone's, what is going on? Yeah. No one whose opinion I value was saying that, but I was just picking it up through the ether. Yeah. But that's not even, you didn't make up. God, just uncoupling. No, it had been it had been coined, I think, in the seventies, and it's such a beautiful concept, right? It's like, you know, you're staring down the barrel of a divorce. It's like your worst outcome possible. Especially, my parents were married till my dad died. I'm all my best friends. I've been friends with from elementary school, middle school, and honors. All their parents are were married. They're all they all married like their high, college or high school person they're all still married like you know i just didn't come from a world where there was a lot of divorce and yeah you couldn't have asked people you you yeah trusted their advice or guidance through it right and i just thought as i looked around and sort of and i knew that we were this was happening and i thought you know i'm gonna try to collect a little data around how people how children have been impacted by divorce and again, sorry to overuse the word, but be intentional about avoiding those common pitfalls. Like what are the common themes here that we see? And one of, and the most common wound that I heard from children of divorce was parents couldn't be in the same room and couldn't be friends. And it took three years. It took 18 years. It took, 
you know, God forbid, the death of a close family member for them to sit at the same table. And, or their wedding or their right. childbirth. Yeah. And tension and this and that. And I just thought, like, I wonder if there's a way to circumvent that and just go to the directly to the point where we're friends and we remember what we loved about each other and constantly acknowledge that we created these two incredible human beings together and like our we commingled our dna we're family that's it so we can pretend we're not and hate each other and drop a kid at the end of the driveway and not come in or like let's try to reinvent this for ourselves and so I think at the time, honestly, I I was in a lot of pain. It was so difficult, and it was such, It felt like such a failure to me. Yeah, and it was so hard, and I was so worried about my kids. And so then there was this whole other layer of like the world turning on us about saying essentially. <laughs> We just want to be nice to each other yeah, yeah, and yeah. try to stay a We're family. We're going to try to do this without a ton of wreckage. No wreckage. Mm-hmm. And, and and it was brutal because I already felt like I had no skin on, you know? Yeah. But then I just had to try to, you know, as, as happens to me in my life and like by pattern recognition, I can see that, you know, I I think the whole point of being here is to try to optimize yourself as much as possible like be as accountable for your shit as possible like stretch yourself grow yeah do the uncomfortable thing in the name of something bigger and more beneficial for your family or your community and sometimes i've said things and it's been too early in the culture or whatever right, right. you're a you little know? ahead of the <laughs> yeah. curve yeah and that's okay like you know of course sometimes i've gotten my feelings hurt but then I, I always think, you know, I I really I really feel I do things from a place of being in integrity. Not that I don't make mistakes, but I try to align my words and my actions as closely as possible. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, like, yeah, something can hurt it can hurt your feelings if, you know, people are like, You're an idiot, why are you saying that? Yeah. But I think at the end of the day when you're when you really believe in what you're doing, it doesn't resonate in a way that like breaks you apart, you know, because you believe in in what you're doing. And you know, the other thing I didn't think about at the time was I think in retrospect, and I've talked about this before in hindsight, but I think the problem with saying, Hey, there's you know, we don't know if it's possible. We're going to try to do this in a nice way where we're not a couple, but we're a family mm-hmm. that I think triggered a lot of people who were the oh, sons yeah. and daughters of very acrimonious divorces or people in the middle of acrimonious divorces. Absolutely. And I didn't, you know, I didn't think about that at the time. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're like, uh, someone's like struggling very hard. It's very challenging for them to deal with their ex. And then they and hear, oh, they, you're, you're doing do- it wrong. That's what they're <laughs> That's what they're hearing. That's not what I said or meant. Yeah. Or, and I don't and judge going, anything. Oh, you're going to do it perfect? Uh, talk yeah. to me in a year. Right, right. You know? Right. That's, yeah, that that's relevant, I suppose. But, um, you know, from your account of it on Stern, it, it felt to me like you came out the place, the exact place you should end up, which is if you know your intentions and you know what you're doing and someone says something contradictory to that, you should be able to recognize it might be that person's thing. And that that can be very liberating. Mm -hmm. We talk about it on here a lot, which is you can give me the same compliment, right? If I'm walking down the street and you stop me and you say, I loved you in something acting wise, if my self-esteem is low, I go, Oh, that person recognized me, and what else were they going to say? They had to be polite. Right. Like, what were they going to say? You sucked in that thing. <laughs> so that's like the worst case scenario. And then if my self-esteem is incredibly high, and they stop me and say that, I think, well, that was nice that they took the time to say that, but it doesn't fill me up because I recognize that's not something that is a real esteemable act, being funny in a movie, you know? Right. I did that very selfishly and for attention and money, so that's not worth getting... Pat on the back. There's really no zone where the comment is is even objectively anything. It's just literally how I'm taking it based on how I how good I feel about myself that day. Right. And I think it's also like a particular byproduct of being an actor as a I think when first of all we all have 
pretty lousy self-esteem. You know, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. we chose it in the first place. Well, so. And it's the human condition is to have shitty self-esteem. Right. But I think also, you know, it's been interesting then going and doing a different kind of career where, you know, if I'm made of, say, like a, I have a cookbook that, you know, I, we, we try to make like healthy, easy food at, at Goop. It's like one of the things we do. And to have somebody come up and say, hey, you know, thank you for this recipe. You know, I could not, never get my kid to eat anything healthy and he only had pasta and grilled cheese and now he's eating this. Like, yeah, that feels different. Yeah. The, to me, that's the difference between this podcast right, exactly. and acting. Yeah. It's like, I believe them when they say it like made an impact on their yeah. life, which is an incredibly, yeah, wonderful feeling. And I think conversely, to be a public person and to get cr criticism leveled at you for whatever reason, I found that, and I had a great therapist that taught me this, that it only really stings if it's a judgment that you're already holding against yourself thousand percent so yeah my my really quick easy example i try to give to dudes that are newly sober is so gwyneth if a million people screamed at you you're too short she's so short you're a fucking midget right it could go on <laughs> forever right and you would never be bothered by it right because you have exactly. zero fear of being too short i have zero fear of being too short right but if you start yelling like you need all the attention in the world. <laughs> the fuck I do? Because like, I'm pretty I'm certain I do. You know, that is a character <laughs> defect I have. Yeah, right. that kind of becomes a good roadmap of like what you should maybe pay attention to, right? right? Is the stuff that truly bothers you. Right. And I would imagine maybe with the conscious uncoupling thing, you must have felt pretty good about that decision. And maybe that one, did that roll off your back a little? I, I mean, it's it's hard to say because it was so layered that whole time with so much. Well, right, so you were already things. probably feeling <laughs> like, at your worst yeah. in many ways. But I will say now it's a few years later and I'm really proud that we did that and that we stuck to it and i've seen you guys together and to me unless you guys yeah. are unless he's an incredible actor as well it seems to be going pretty peaceful yeah. we really we we really have stayed close and i think it it doesn't mean that we don't have our difficult things with each other but like the way you would with anyone well, in your family you, when you're married it's fucking difficult right. so there's no way you know right. that's not without difficulty were there steps that you took like for for listeners or something so i think I think the most important thing to do is let go of spite mm -hmm. because it's an emotion, it's a feeling that really can just co-opt yeah, the, the human soul really quickly. Mm. So you just have to practice like, I don't know, I, I was very present of like not, you know, of course, not, not sublimating feelings. You have to let feelings come up and go through, but... The feeling, I think spite is a very dangerous emotion and I was very conscious not to act from that place mm. and it took restraint. Like we're all human and these things happen and things come up and... Um, yeah, you're always going to probably have a, a first thought, right? Like a knee jerk, instinctual right. first thought. So how do you build a cushion between that feeling that comes up like you're, like you're going to vomit and action? It's like... I, I always tried to think of like, I need to build a pause here. Yeah. I yeah. need to build a cushion and I would sort of like picture building some kind of cushiony vessel where I was like, I'm just going to hold on to this for a second and not act from this place or say anything from this place. By the way, this is straight AA. It's like we pause. Is it? Yeah. We pause when we become agitated. So it's oh, like. Interesting. As a uh, modus operandi, you are obligated at all times to give yourself a little time before you ever take action. It's just kind of like in any situation when agitated. So, like any time that you're brusque, when agitated, yeah, it. it's time to pause, pause and maybe even call someone and run your idea by them. Yeah. Just check in with someone yeah. objective on the outside. Yeah. But I, I don't know about you, but I was with someone for nine years before, Kristen, who I very much love. We didn't have children, but I'd say we consciously uncoupled. We're yeah. still very good friends. But it's funny because the first year we had broken up, I was very aware of the many ways she caused that, the, the destruction of that relationship. I could have listed 13 things she did. To Were you sober at that time? I was. Okay. I was a year sober. As the hurt feelings dissipated, 
my own indiscretions started getting more obvious to me mm -hmm. and more and more as that yeah that hurt left i could start to see my side of the street which was mm -hmm. fucking messy as hell right. way worse than hers like you know if you really were to put it on the scale of justice mine was much heavier mm -hmm. and i found myself over the years just calling her as i would think of these things like you know i really shouldn't have blank 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 and one day she goes uh, dax it's fine i love you i got it you you've made your amends i don't need, i don't need to hear I, the full I, inventory. She's like, Listen, I like you. I right. have a good memory of you, let's, and I let's love leave you. it that way. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to to, to be yeah. tedious about this exploration. But it just, in my own experience, I'm like, oh yeah, you can really become blinded by by being wounded or hurt or sad or all these things, you know. And also, to your point about spite, there was a great chapter in a Malcolm Gladwell book about contempt and this guy who who who, who videotapes couples having uh, married couples talking about something they disagree about and after an hour of watching them he can predict are they going to divorce or yes yeah. and, but even you, he keeps backing it down and he can watch for five fucking minutes and predict yeah. with like 80 percent accuracy amazing and his thing is contempt when people yeah. have contempt for each other it's over it's over it's it's very hard yeah to come back from that i see it you see it all the time in currently married couples yeah and so my kind of mantra i have to practice because there's many times i can't stand Kristen, you know in any given week and the only thing i try to play least myself is I, I don't try to not be mad at her or judgmental but mm -hmm. I try to watch the words I'm using mm -hmm. so she's never a bitch she's acting bitchy today right she's never selfish she's that thing was selfish you know right. what I'm saying like it's just really it's this tiniest thing but, Same but with it's parenting. not a permanent condition yes I was gonna say and now I find it I am applying it to my kids all the time like I want to go like Oh, she's messy. No, she's not messy. Right. Today she made a mess. And the difference in the difference in that language as it pertains to your child, I think, is that your wife can be like, fuck you. Uh, don't call me a bitch. But a child, there's a shame infusion that happens when you say you are messy, right? Uh huh. As opposed They're to They're flawed, like, basically. Right. Yeah. They they hear I'm flawed I'm broken. Like, and it's the shame it's the shame that comes in and that's something that I try to be aware of as well with my kids yeah to me language is so important it really is and we don't put a ton of thought behind it as mm -hmm. we're using it when you brought up the shame of getting divorced it reminded me my, my mom was in here and I interviewed her like you interviewed your mother my mom's got an crazy, crazy, incredible story. Many, many husbands. Started as a janitor on Midnight's. Built this huge wow. company. Raised three kids by herself. She's a fucking beast. I need to listen to this podcast. You would really, really one. like it. It's really special. But my second, my first stepdad physically abused her. And she, at a point in this story, contemplated killing him when he passed out one time with a frying pan. And the reason she didn't is because she didn't want my brother and I to be raised in an orphanage. Right. right. So... She's telling the story, and it, and I know her story inside and out. I was there. I witnessed it. But what never occurred to me is I, I said, wow, it's hard knowing what a strong woman you are. How could you have found yourself in an abusive relationship? This doesn't add up. Like, you're not the person who takes mm -hmm. shit. You're not the person that would stick around. And she said, you know, the shame of having to admit I failed again a second time was stronger Aww. than that. Getting right. beaten up was less painful mm. than the shame of admitting failure a second time and my fucking heart broke oh, and i man. thought man it always circles back to shame doesn't it it's like it's so powerful it is it's the most corrosive powerful and then it leads to more and more behavior right. that produces more and more shame uh, exactly so getting to my question about your daughters mm -hmm. how are you what is your philosophy and around raising girls with good self-esteem yeah and how do you action that so i think you and i probably both agree that i think modeling is way more effective than talking yeah so like it's as much of a journey for me as it is for them it's like walking the walk in front of them is hard very simple stuff right like i learned this and you probably already know this every single kid sees their parents fight Almost no kids see their parents make up because right. you fight publicly and you make up in the bedroom. Right. So that's oh, something. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I want to make up to you. <laughs> to get that in front of them is hard. There's so much vulnerability and you're exposed. But we make a point. We'll like start to work it out in the bedroom and we'll go. Oh fuck! Let. 
I don't want to either, but let's go do this in front of the kids. It's awkward as fuck, but we do it. <clears throat> like we so make up in great. front of them. I've never heard of that before. That's brilliant. Again, this will be triggering. I don't Someone think will be so. mad at me at home going like, Well, if I was rich, I could do that too. It seems that like <laughs> no matter what I say, it's like if I exercise, it's like, yeah, well, if I was rich, I would exercise too. Everything but by the way, I can relate. I grew up fucking poor and I hated rich people and anything that good happened to a rich person, I was like, Yeah, if I was rich, I'd have fucking curly hair too. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really matter. It's just a cute cure-all when a spoiler alert it's not a cure-all i wanted it to be no. but it was not but um okay so i also believe that like i can only offer them what i do so for me and my and kristen and i's is different right so for me my self-esteem builders are physical exercise is number one for me yeah I have to go get those good endorphins or i will be on medication i know right, it right right and so even if they're going to watch TV on Saturday, they get to watch cartoons on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, I bring them the down to the gym and they watch. Oh, if I was rich and I had a gym. <laughs> yeah. I, <got> a <laughs> <laughs> I bring them down to the basement of our house where I have workout equipment. So I'm fucking rich. And uh, I'll put their cartoons on there. And then they have, you know, they're forced to watch me work out for an hour. Which I guess is weirdly perverse, too. I can also see like a great. But they watch cartoons movie. while you work out? Yeah. Right. So they're just in the gym with me spending that time while I work mm -hmm. out. And then... Um, and sometimes they do like stretches. They like <laughs> want to be a part of it. Right, right. They do. And they How have, old are they? Mm, five and four. Okay. So yeah, they have little pink weights and then they'll get in the mix for a minute. Oh, but then, so cute. <laughs> they get distracted. My number one thing, my singular thing I, I hope to impart on them is a regimen of physical activity. I have this overarching theory that we, we don't live the way we were designed to live. And the result of that is kind of pandemic depression because we're not moving right. enough and we're not getting those the reward for right. having tilled a field or gone hunting, whatever it is. I think right. we're all. And so, I do think and I know this sounds like a little nuts, but I think that we all certainly for me. And so I'll extrapolate it out. I process emotion when I move. Like mm. if I, if I'm sad or I'm confused about something or I'm angry and I just take a walk, yeah. I feel much, much better afterwards. Just, I don't know if it's the fresh air. I don't know if it's the movement. I don't know if it's the combination of it, whatever, or the peace and quiet, but. You and I, Monica have that in common. That's her. Yeah. That's my remedy. Secret yeah. power. I, I, I like, I walk and, and I, and I dance too. I do. I do. Well, yeah, if I was as rich as you, I could dance exactly. whenever I wanted. <clears throat> yeah, in fact, when um, dudes I sponsor, if they call me up and they're ranting about something, I'll go, listen, dude, I'm happy to hear this after you exercise yeah. for an hour. Exercise for an hour and call me back and just, right. let's see if it's the same rant. Do you pass the responsibility baton back to the person? Is that your job as a well, sponsor? For, hey, look, everyone gets to decide how they want to do it. My personal thing is... When you've done X, Y, and Z, and you still have a problem, then we know you still have a problem. Then let's let's then let's right. throw the tools at it. Let's, gotcha. let's do a four step about it. Let's do this. But but this this sounds like it's just general human angst. How long have you been a sponsor? I've been sober fourteen years, and maybe starting a year in or something. I would st I felt confident enough to like guide some people. You know. How did you decide to get sober? I. Well, I made many, many decisions to get sober and I tried many, many times and failed many, many times. And I mean, in a very most basic nutshell, by the way, it was not not too long before I very first met you. Because I very first met you. I'll never forget it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in the do bedroom? tell. Yeah. I turned to the right and I am coming out of a blackout. No, <laughs> I met you in John's living room right as you were about to do Iron Man. Oh my God, weird. And I knew John because I got sober to do Zathura, which was the movie right before wow. Iron Man. That's its whole story that I want to make everything about you. I got to say, I'm Please just going to say it really quick. But I will say you're one of the handful of people that when I turned the corner and saw you, I was like, oh, God damn. Yeah, that person has the X factor. <laughs> like that's an overwhelming presence. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of like, uh, I found myself a bit intimidated by you. Oh I still God. find myself a little bit intimidated by you. Which goes back to the thing that people 
people are triggered by yeah probably yeah yeah Yeah, you have some kind of x factor which is is just really pleasant and i could see being jealous of it luckily i'm a guy (laughs) not to others (laughs) so i'm not like fuck her why why does her skin look like Well, no one should have that reaction (laughs) that people do because it's easy to do that it is wait go back to sorry go back no no, okay i got distracted by your beauty okay (laughs) so exercise is number one number my number two is being of service to people who, who will, will not benefit me, right? So I, I'm not going to get anything out of it. And, and generally, a good indicator of it's the right service to do is I don't want to do it. I don't want to answer the phone from a dude I'm, I'm uh, sponsoring. I don't, I don't wake up because I'm in the mood to wake up. I wake up because one of those two assholes is screaming <laughs> and they require my <laughs> attention. And then for the next 90 minutes of every morning is shit I don't want to do. There's yeah. nothing worse than brushing a three-year-old's teeth. It's almost impossible. I'd rather fucking it's brush a, a crocodile's target. teeth. <laughs> yeah. They hate it. And they act like they're doing you a favor. And I'm always like, Delta, you think I like this? I don't like this either. We're both in a shitty situation. Let's make the best of this. And I know. And then you look back and it, I mean, it's so finite. Now I wish I could brush teeth. Although <laughs> you kill to brush your 12 year old's teeth. Probably. What I don't miss <laughs> is the ass wiping. Oh. oh, now that I'm fine with. I'm just like, I, I, I'm fine with it. I'm just glad that he is autonomous in that capacity. <laughs> he can handle it. Yeah. You know, like sure. I, I didn't mind it at the time, but I'm just glad that that's, we've moved on. Yeah, I don't know what it's, I think we got to learn it on here because we talk about it so much because I've pooped my pants many times throughout my life and what? these stories end up. <laughs> Why? <laughs> a reaction. <laughs> that's the appropriate reaction. That was a real like, yeah, that was a great reaction. We <laughs> like, don't need another take. That was, you said everything. <laughs> like from being sick or being drunk or. You name it, Gwyneth. I have just been bold and arrogant and thought, hmm, it feels like I might have diarrhea, but I'm just going to do a tiny bit of a little fart and just <laughs> check and see if it is. And then go on, oh boy, yep, that was, you should have listened to your body. There's been that. There's been, you know, a heavy drug abuse, which is kind of like. Uh, was drugs your thing or alcohol? Yeah, yeah. Well, cocaine and, and Jack and Diet. Those were my two Jack, favorite things. Does cocaine make you poopy Shit, you're Quite often when you first do those first few lines, it's quite often cut with baby laxative. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. That seems unethical. It's, <laughs> <laughs> we just we just had this debate, Monica and I, the other day, which is I have this fantasy of I will return to using alcohol in my 80s in a retirement community because my penis will no longer work, so I'm not going to get in trouble there. Right. I won't be driving a car anymore, just a golf cart, no problem there. Right. And we decided, I think no drug dealer would ethically sell like an 85-year-old man cocaine, right? He'd be certain the guy's heart would blow up. I'm pretty sure drug dealers don't have ethics like that. That's what I said. I said, yeah. But you never know. They're still human. My dad used to say that about smoking because we made him quit smoking when we were little. Uh Uh-huh. He was like, I, I can't wait till they go to college. I'm going to start smoking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, he never did. did. No, he yeah. never did. I got a hunch that our fathers were semi-similar. Let me finish up myself as okay. listen, and then I want to ask you about your And you have to your finish day. your so- sobriety. You were saying, what made you get sober? Okay, right. So I would just say that in general, there's kind of this, I, what I would say is a fallacy of there being a rock bottom. There are many multiple rock bottoms for me. But the one, uh, the one, one last one was... A week before I started that movie, Zathura, I'm like, I need a vacation. I went to Hawaii with a friend from Detroit. I bought crystal meth. I smoked it the whole time. I had all these dangerous things happen to me. I got in a car accident with a a local dude that was on our way to get coke. And I decided to run the crystal meth out of my system on the beach for a two-hour run. Almost, I mean, just madness. Absolute madness. I was so sick by the time I had to fly back from Hawaii to LA. And I had a layover in San Francisco. And I was so physically sick that I knew I wasn't going to be able to make that flight from San Francisco to L.A. unless I got some Jack and Diets in me. So I'm sitting in the corner of this bar and I'm ordering like Jack and Diet after Jack and Diet. And there is a mirror next to me and I'm really huddled into the corner because I have been sober up to that point. And so I know people from this is a relapse, Ah. like a three week long relapse. And I'm so afraid I'm going to see someone from AA and they're going to see me drinking at this bar. Right. So I'm really huddled in this bar. And I have this moment where. And you're famous already. I'm already famous. And this is part of it. I just have this moment where I go, oh, my God, every single thing you set out to do that you ever dreamt of doing is happening right now. You uh, what I thought. Like, if I had a million dollars, I would feel this way. And if people recognized me and thought I was good, I'd feel this way. And if I, like, 
every marker, every goal I had ever set in my life was happening at that exact moment. And I was fucking hiding from the world in the corner of this bar. And I was as sad and as miserable and as demoralized as I've ever been in my life with everything I'd ever wanted. And I thought something's really broken because all these things that you were certain would make you feel a, a certain way, you have them all and you were suicidal. And that was... Again, I feel so grateful that I could have had that many th dreams come true. Because I think I would have been yeah. telling myself, oh, my misery is still stemming from the place that I didn't make partner. I didn't do this or I didn't. I was so privileged to get to a position where right. it's like, no, it's none of those fucking things because you got them right. all. And you were how old? 29. Right. So what a gift to be 29 and be able to realize like there is no external factor that is going to like no as you say nobody gets that gift no and even it's as really i tell it to sad. people i i understand that they won't believe it and yeah. i totally get it but i'll tell friends i'm like i know it feels like money is the thing and i know you you're not going to believe me but it just it certainly makes some things convenient but it just doesn't fill the hole inside it's that's not healing no it's not healing isn't that the same criteria that almost like that drugs i mean it sort of seems like it's a, that's such a manufactured high of the ego it's like i got the promotion here's a quantifiable here's quantifiable proof that i'm worth x uh-huh like i imagine i've never really done drugs but i imagine like you do drugs and you're like oh i'm i'm there like for a minute and then you're the like room. anytime you attach to that ephemeral feeling of high, whether it's a drug or like an ego boost, it's not real. It's not real. But if you, you know, if you were me, those pockets of time where I was optimistic and I believed things were going to work out well and I was worthy of love and all these things, it was a huge relief. You How know? much do you think that there is a relationship between being if, if if you feel unhealed and and the panacea of like drug addiction what where does it stem from in your opinion well what's really interesting is i just by the way i'm i just got self-conscious this is way too much about me i'm way more interested in you but, it, but, but really me. quick i have I'm a two podcast here that's, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> okay so thinking. i'll say this i just weirdly enough i want to have a cognitive behavioral therapist on this show so I called Dr. Drew last night and said, hey, do you know a great one? And we got to talking. And there's this great guy, Yona Hari. Hari. Uh -huh. Have you heard about this guy? He mm. wrote a book. He's a really impressive dude. And he wrote a book about addiction. And it's pretty counter to the many of the ideals that, say, Dr. Drew and I believe in, right? And, and I was saying, oh, I'm going to interview that guy. So I want to know what your complaints are. Because in a nutshell, he said, okay, the very famous study we all know about is that rats, if given the choice between food and cocaine, they will just do the cocaine until they die, right? That's, everyone knows that. A, another scientist said, what's rat nirvana? Well, rat nirvana is you got a wheel, you got this, you got these, all, like eight things comprise rat nirvana. And if you put them in rat nirvana and then give them the choice between food and cocaine, they choose food. Oh, interesting. So this Yona's theory is that it's largely nurture. It's largely what's happening in your life and how fulfilled you feel and all these different things. And so by Dr. Drew and I's account that really it, it, you're not accounting for a whole lot of addicts that have those things. Right. So at any rate, what we, the conclusion Dr. Drew and I both agreed upon is sadly with all human things, we're the hardest people to study. We're the hardest things mm -hmm. to predict on the planet. And there is no consensus. We're very complex. It's we're true. We're so complex. Do you have siblings? I do. I have an older brother and a younger sister. Do any of them have? My brother's sober. Okay. <laughs> My dad died sober. But yes, yeah, so genetically for sure. Right. And then I have all kinds of trauma from childhood. Right. But then even if you look at the difference between he and I, like the variation so different in the, the way the addiction the manifested oh, itself. Mm -hmm. So to sum it all up. Wait, so you're, hold on, but you're in the bar and then you're, you have this epiphany and then what do you do? I go back to AA like I always did. I had kind of shattered that illusion that, that, that it was these external things that I was really lacking. And and then I also did it in a way that I'd never done it before, which is I, I really allowed myself to be humble and vulnerable and take direction and isolate someone who had what I wanted and ask them how they got this thing I wanted. And I don't know why it stuck this time. It's it's all kind of mysterious. And I can understand the frustration of people who have addicts in their lives because they want it to, to be 
predictable and it's for us it's not yeah. i don't know why it worked this time i don't know why for some people get it and some people don't get it you know but certainly some of those breakthroughs i think of going oh yeah there's an inside job we'll come right back to dax When I was sitting down to write my cookbook, The Clean Plate, the first rule was that everything had to taste really good. The second was that every recipe had to comply with the fundamentals of clean eating. The challenge of cleaning up a recipe is inherently interesting to me, but maybe the most challenging part was coming up with a clean pantry to begin with. Once you cut out the junk, you're essentially just left with raw ingredients. So they need to be hero ingredients that you can lean on and use again and again, like Blue Diamond Whole Natural Almonds. Blue Diamond uses non-parel Supremes, which sounds very fancy and tastes really good. Their almonds are also a good source of magnesium and an excellent source of vitamin E, which I've always been told is a smart addition to a healthy skin routine. You can find Blue Diamond Whole Natural Almonds in a six ounce can or on the go packs. If you're stocking your pantry, go for the one pound or 25 ounce bag. You can blend the almonds into smoothies or just keep them on hand for snacks. To see how our fashion editor likes her Blue Diamond Whole Natural Almonds, just head to goop.com. All right, time to get back to Dax Shepard. How much of your day is about sobriety you know increasingly less the longer i am sober of course but in general i start i had i'm embarrassed to admit this but for the very first 12 years of sobriety i didn't miss a single day not one i got crazy superstitious about it i wrote a page in my journal every single morning because i had this thought that if i can't commit 20 minutes to remembering i'm an addict each morning I'm going to end up blowing nine hours a day as an addict. I have to be able to say, minimally, this is your commitment. You've got to acknowledge you're an addict. Every day, first thing, right when you wake up, you write a page. And it doesn't even have to be about being an addict. It's just it's just this physical activity that, to remind right. myself, I have a thing that I'll never not have. It's the power of ritual. Power of ritual. Yeah, I buy that. Is Is your wife sober? No, but she... She's the least addictive person I've ever met, and it's so frustrating. When we first met, <laughs> she smoked. Like, when we first met, she smoked. Not a ton, but she smoked in the evening or whatever right. with her friends and roommates. And then, like, one day I pointed out to her, I'm like, you realize you haven't smoked in a month and a half. Like, did you quit? And she goes, oh, I haven't? Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, my God. When I quit smoking, it was like a, a whole minute to minute. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. The, I mean, nothing's been harder in my whole life. Yeah. You were a smoker, oh, right? Oh, yes. Oh, and is, didn't you love it? I smoked a pack a day probably until mm. I was 25 years old. Yeah. Like, wake up and light a cigarette. Absolutely. Yeah. A few I, things are nicer. I really was into it. <laughs> it was your thing, right? I loved it. But you didn't do drugs. No, I never really did drugs. I never, I mean, I've tried a couple things. Have you had, I hope you've done mushrooms. I've never done mushrooms. You haven't? I've never done acid. I've never done. MDMA? I did MDMA Good. once. Did you enjoy it? I'm trying to get Monica to do it really bad. Yeah, you want to... I had a lot of trauma come up and I was like crying and mm -hmm. I think it was productive, but it wasn't like. I'm at a rave, you know, like with my shirt off. It wasn't. You weren't making out with anyone during no, it? No, totally not. You should do it one more time and make out. I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A few things feel like... better in life than making out on MDMA. Really? Oh, my God. Okay. Well, maybe it... I cleared something and I need to try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, passed, we, we got through the trauma. Now let's just get into the pleasure. Just one time. Yeah. I'm, you can I, come I, to I our ecstasy, ecstasy party. We're are you gonna have one? We're gonna have one. It's been in the it's in the books. So what do you do during an ecstasy party? <laughs> I just make sure everyone's Happy. enjoying themselves. And, and if anyone, I, if I notice anyone's like freaking out a little bit mentally, I'll be there to go like, hey, I'm sober. Yeah, you can trust me right now. This is nothing. See, but that's why I don't do drugs because like <laughs> that's always that's always me. You're afraid of Anxious. being out of control. Yeah, like one time when I was a teenager, I smoked too much pot and it was like, I thought I was hallucinating or maybe I was, I don't know. Yeah. And it really freaked me out. Like I'm just not a good drug person. 
And do you, it's got to be because you must like control, yeah? <laughs> you think? Now, let me ask you. Do you think you have an idea of why you desire control? I mean, I think, I, I think it's always the opposite of fear, isn't it? I'm, or, or like our solution. It's like fear-based a- action, right. right? It's something that I... I'm aware of and I work on and I hate that about myself. Like I hate that I have inextricably linked fear and control Mm -hmm. as like two sides of a coin. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's just, it's, it can be incapacitating. I mean, like flying is a perfect example. It's like when I'm, if I'm on a takeoff and it's really bumpy, like I'm, I get really scared. You do? Yeah. Was there anything about childhood? Well, let me just ask. So your mother was an actress. Mm -hmm. She still is. Is an actress. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And your father was? Was. Is a director. He was a, he made TV shows. That's, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, he wrote, directed and produced TV shows and like The White Shadow. I don't know if you're too young. No, I'm not too young. Which was a great show yeah, and a absolutely. really br- groundbreaking show. And then he made one called St. Elsewhere about a hospital. Mm. So he made really oh. good shows. And he. So he was a creator of St. Elsewhere? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's incredibly yeah. impressive. And he ran that show for years. And it I tried to. Show. I tell people on here who don't have a great, you know, in depth understanding of show business that the number one badasses in the whole thing are showrunners. Yeah. And nobody. Yeah has it's a harder pretty job crazy and i just married a showrunner so it's we've gone full circle i could talk about him for an hour <laughs> by the way he's such a babe he's such a babe i met him we were somewhere and i was telling you the pattern i get into every time i attend something like that i don't know if you remember this i remember it perfectly uh, okay i thought it was a really ripe conversation for you and i to have because you grew up around all this right and that, that probably came with some some benefits and some some handicaps yeah sure. yeah so having two parents in film and television do you feel like you noticed that they were they were measuring their worth at times in comparison to other people and you became aware of interesting that being something you know like a preoccupation i don't i think children are so narcissistic Mm. it's like you don't you just you're absorbing you're kind of like on your parents wi-fi and you're feeling whatever you know but i I don't think i was that observant about their how they went through their lives as adults and i think i wanted when my mother would be you know rehearsing check off at the williamstown theater festival and i was a kid sitting there watching her i just wanted to be that I didn't even this is like I didn't even understand that she was you know I'm talking like I'm a year and a half or two years three years old and on just thinking whatever is happening to my mother right now Uh that level of freedom empowerment expression like I want to be that yeah so so and just to really drill into it is it that you just wanted to be mom or you were also recognizing that mom was in a position where all the attention was focused on her she was steering the ship. There was a lot of power and all that. Can you separate I think which was which? I was recognizing <clears throat> the difference between her at home and on stage. Oh, it, and it's kind of in life and on and in her element, like doing her art. Yeah, it's rare for par- for kids to see their parents do the thing that they yeah excel at or or yeah. special at, right? Yeah, and I got, I was so lucky because I got to watch her work at it like rehearse and you know i always ran lines with her and Uh i felt very proud of her talent and her commitment and and were you the type of child that would try to like get involved in it like would you run out on stage yeah yeah totally yeah i'm in this precarious situation with our kids and i imagine you wrestle with it a lot too but it's it's you're unique in that your your kids are now second generation or third generation show business. So you certainly mm-hmm. are probably in a better position than I am because you grew up that way and you probably know the pitfalls. And Right. I think the benefit of growing up in it is that, I, you know, I think, you know, we're Americans. Movies and entertainment is one of our biggest exports. It's a huge driver of our economy. And, and at the same time, it's also like this 
this fantasy world that we dream about, like, could I ever be that? And it seems like uh, a cure. I think I, the benefit for me is that that was not why I was doing it. I mean, I wasn't, I just wanted to be like my mom when she was playing Blanche Dubois. Right. You weren't craving per se, like, uh, fame. No. You, you actually wanted to be a part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to have the feeling that I saw her having when she was, you know, like crushing some insane monologue and making everybody yeah. feel so much. But we've been in a couple of, and they're very rare, and I <clears throat> I try to minimize them, but but we've been in a couple of situations where, say, like, we, Kristen shot on a cruise ship, we had to be on the cruise ship while she filmed. What I was kind of observing is like, oh, wow, it's clicking to Lincoln that all these people on this ship are interested in mom. Yeah. And then I'm also recognizing that she rightly so is kind of possessive of that attention. Like she wants that's that that's her mom. That's not everyone else's mom. Right. So it's, I'm just kind yeah. of watching the complexity of this scenario and I'm trying to evaluate like, oh, is this a good, you know, is this destructive? Is there a way for me to explain this to her? Like just again, trying to be intentional about what's going on because it is unique. And then people may be connecting the dots that that's her daughter and now she's getting an amount of attention that's not right for a kid to get. Right. It's all very complicated. And I, and then of course I get very protective of the whole thing. And for that reason, I ultimately just, I don't love them to be on set. I've decided. Yeah. I don't like how the adults treat them, that they've kind of got this elevated status yeah, because yeah. there are kids and everyone's mm -hmm. so excited they're there. I'm like, no, no. Kids are pieces of shit. When you go visit your parents <laughs> at work, you're an annoying piece of shit and everyone ignores you. That's that's normal. <laughs> so, you know, what what did you learn from being a child in that situation? Yeah. That I mean, it was a very different time, Dax. Like, there wasn't social media. There wasn't the internet. And fame was different then. And also, my parents weren't that famous. Like, they were amazingly talented working people, but not necessarily... You know, they. My mom wasn't a household name. You right. know, and I th people who loved acting and loved movies definitely know knew who my mom was, and, and she's more famous now, funnily enough. But I would have those situations where, we, like, I remember once being in Howard Johnson's, like eating the fried clams. That was my favorite uh -huh. thing. <laughs> Hojo's. Hojo's again. And William see, she's not an entitled piece of shit. She's <laughs> fried she clams. Had Hojo's. Come on, guys. Fried clams is my favorite food. Oh wow. Fried clams and french fries yeah i'm yeah. a fried food that's my weakness me too i could get rid of sweets me too yeah. i don't have to fuck with that no but like just give me anything fried give me that salt girl give me that salt and that deep fry How but about I, deep fried scrimps do you like those deep fried what <laughs> scrimps shrimp <laughs> yes i love it oh Aren't they with beautiful? cocktail sauce. Oh, um, or how about a little mayonnaise on there? I'll do mayonnaise, that. Mayonnaise, tartar sauce, whatever. <laughs> yeah, pick your sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Hot sauce. <laughs> but I remember this woman coming up to her and being so starstruck. And that that's the moment that I connect. I was like, oh, like there's something else happening here. And this woman is like projecting so much onto my mom. And like I could, I didn't have that language, but I could feel how powerfully she was impacting this person. Yeah. And did you like it? Yeah. Or? Oh, I thought okay, it was good. amazing. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I, I think we, this generation, like it's a little bit more precarious in that, as I said, like, fame, got a camera. fame is its own thing. Well, that's, that's what I worry about. So, I think it's great that people take whatever opportunity is in their hand and they amplify it and they create wealth. And I think that's really wonderful. Yeah. I'm saying it, contextually speaking as a parent, mm -hmm. I don't want the message to be that fame in and of itself is a career. Yes. Yeah. And I think you could argue that it now is, but I, that's not my hope. Right. For them. I really would love recognition in life to come from the that the powerful wheel goes on and you shall contribute a verse like that your verse that the verse you are contributing to the cosmic poem is something that is going to be meaningful or 
you know, move a field forward in, in a certain way. We watched this uh, a documentary called American Meme on Netflix. Yes, like, I watched that. It? Oh, my God. Uh, and the whole time, of course, I'm like, I never and- heard of the slut whisperer before. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, what's funny is like. Although uh, I'm sure you were one in your day, Dax. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you this. I, 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 I looked for endless validation from people I thought were high status for sure. I definitely thought if I could get someone fancy, beautiful, and high status to love me, that I would then look in the mirror and see Brad Pitt. And it just never worked. It never ended up happening, sadly. It'd be great. It'd be a great shortcut. Well, (laughs) Uh, not through getting someone high status. (laughs) I mean, I did end up with someone high status, but but, but I didn't know she was high status when I met her. I really didn't have any sense that like this person was going to validate me in some right. way but but prior to that i had done that up to a bunch of women i definitely all from junior high on like oh that girl's out of my league if i could get her right then i would you know maybe i am better than i thought i was and what what was it about your wife specifically that you were like this is my person well first and foremost i think it's very helpful if you have a partner that you have decided that they are ultimately good like that they are truly good, that they are not at at no point when you're disagreeing with them or fighting with them. Do you think their motivation is Mm -hmm. ever to destroy you, belittle you, make you feel worse? Right. I think if, if you are certain about that with somebody, it makes the rest of it a lot easier because I spin narratives in my head very quickly Mm -hmm. and I can I can convince myself someone is uh, out to destroy me very quickly. Wow, where's that from? Well, I'm just very creative, and I'm a writer, and <laughs> I, have, I have this huge skill set I can deploy at any time. Oh, these theories I've come up with, I've, I've voiced a few of them on here. They're preposterous. Uh, once I'm away from them, they're preposterous. I meet I meet Kristen, and I got to say, 11 years ago, ideologically, we were very, very far apart on many, many issues. She was a, a Christian, and she had a lot of moral thoughts that I didn't agree with that scared me about raising kids with her. I had all these things I was terrified were going to destroy us ultimately if we kept going forward. But I had, at the core, I had this belief, well, this human being is a good, good human being. Mm-hmm. and And if she's that, then we can kind of work through everything else mm-hmm. and I don't know I just I think that's one of the keys for me was just knowing that her intentions her actions I might object to at all times but I think if I always drill deep enough I'll find that her intentions right. are pretty good and you give her like blanket benefit of the doubt it sounds like because you know she's a good person like she's coming from a good place yes and when I'm when I'm weaving these insane hypotheses up in my head about what she was doing I always run it through the filter of like well but she'd have to be evil to be doing that and I know she's for not. certain she's not evil right but we more than any relationship i've ever had it was as dicey as it could be the first three years i mean we were in therapy every week i don't even know why we before were before you were married oh yeah we started in therapy wow. we started dating we went away and did a movie together we wanted to fucking kill each other on this movie and when we got home we were basically like we're, we got to go to therapy or we got to break up one of those two things has to happen and so we started therapy three months into our relationship that's uh, unorthodox. And we would have never, ever made it if we didn't do that. It is unorthodox, which is ridiculous because if you believe in the ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure, why wait till there's seven years of yeah. wreckage to unravel and hurt feelings and betrayal and all these things? Why not start when you have a shot at forgiveness? Well, it's so brilliant, too, because if you <clears throat> think about, I had a therapist who said to me once that a an intimate relationship is just a meditation in everything that's wrong with you. An intimate relationship is a meditation in everything that's wrong with you. Right. So whatever is getting kicked up for you by that person mm-hmm. is like, oh, what this is what's wrong with me. Like, oh. you know, I'm triggered by this. Like, I, this is obviously clearly unresolved. I haven't healed this trauma. Like, yes. I'm projecting this. So if you look at it that way, then it makes perfect sense to start I don't know, unpacking everything with the person you're going to yeah, like take the opportunity of this intimate relationship, even if it's not the person you end up marrying and having kids with, like, why not 
go for it and explore yeah. like, wow, why is this person so triggering for me? And by the way, if you start at the beginning, the solutions are incredibly easy, whereas they're very complex right. towards the back end of it. So do so, you still refer back to those? Mm, oh, 100 percent. So like w w he watched us argue. It was her therapist, which for me was like, I guess I'll go see your therapist. He's going to be on your side. But OK. But she's like, oh, he's sober. I'm like, oh, then I'm in. He watches argue for 15 minutes. He goes, all right, stop. Here's what's going on. Dax is an ex scumbag. He always was in trouble. He is prone to feel like he's in trouble, but he's not in trouble now. And you have depression and you go quiet. And when he, wow. when you go quiet, he interprets that he's in trouble. And now he starts thinking of all the ways he might be in trouble. Then he gets defensive. Then he starts attacking you. I don't deserve to be in trouble. He goes, listen, all you got to do to solve all this is look at Dax and go, I'm feeling quiet. It has nothing to do with you. It's just kind of my depression. And she's like, oh, I can do that. And I'm like, oh, she does that. I'm golden. I'll go do something fun instead of <laughs> obsessing about why she's mad at me. And there were just a million little tiny practical wow. things that he could see immediately and then he could, we could head off all the time, you know? Amazing. And then we go in for a tune up because a new pattern would arise. And it's just all these patterns that are very hard to see when you're on the inside of it. Yeah, right? For sure. Okay. Again, we're, I now got to get to a couple things I want to get to. Okay. Anyone who knows me ha knows I have two main obsessions. Okay. Unbridled obsessions. One is Brad Pitt. Oh. I fucking love him so much, Gwyneth. I mean, I love him in a way. <laughs> this is how much I love him. Someone said to me, how far would you go with him? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> hugging, yes. Some kissing, for sure. Shirts off, okay, let's starting to get right. dicey. <laughs> <clears throat> so I would go to like shirts off and hugging. Like right. that's how deep it is. Wow. In fact, I had I this. I get it. That's like skin to skin. Like, yeah. Like someone, I get it. Yeah. Right. So just okay. this crazy obsession about him since I was a young kid. The other person I'm obsessed with is Jay-Z. Oh my gosh. And. These are two great obsessions, by the way. Jay-Z, I can't even explain to you what I, what I feel when I think about him in my head. And I just want to tell you one really funny story. So Kristen wanted me to go to the Met Ball like five years in a row. And I'm like, I don't want to go to the Met Ball. I don't like getting dressed up. I'm, I don't like it. I feel less than when I'm there. It's all, it's not a fun experience. Blah, 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 blah. One year she goes, hey, do you want to go to the Met Ball? I think you're going to say yes this year because we'll, we'll be sitting at Jay-Z's table. And I go, yeah, I'm there. 100% there. I go to New York and go to the Met Ball just so that I can win over Jay-Z. <laughs> and as luck would have it, I am next to Jay-Z. Wow. I give Jay-Z my A game 100%. I, I try to win him over so hard. I promise you if mid-meal I went to the bathroom and I bumped into him in the bathroom, he would not know I was sitting at his table. I'm convinced of it. This is how... This is how... This is one of your crazy head stories. Everyone else Jack at the Shepherd. table... Everyone else at the table liked me, wanted to talk to me. I couldn't be bothered. I just... I needed him to like me so much and I and I know I shit the bed. It was a very poor mm. outing. And... How, how long ago was this? <clears throat> this was probably like eight years ago or something. Oh. But it just so I happens... I don't think now... now knowing... What you have revealed about yourself through this conversation uh -huh. thus far and stories that you can sometimes convince yourself of that might not be very based in actual reality, uh -huh. I, I don't think that this is true. What if I told you that Kristen would confirm that he had very little interest? Then I would believe you. <laughs> he's, he's, that's, I, I just find that hard to believe though. He's a very curious and soulful person who you know what i'd never factor into it as we don't do is that maybe jay-z hates being there maybe he's got something that he's maybe he had sure, his own like journey. any hetero husband <laughs> likes being at the <laughs> ball. <laughs> can i say that yeah, yeah absolutely but 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 you know what we don't do is we never like i'm trapped in my own narcissism i don't think like oh maybe maybe jay had a bad experience on the way here Maybe he's something's on his mind and he wants to get home and deal with something. Any number of things that don't involve me could right. have been going and that's on. That's absolutely true. And it's an important lesson. <laughs> yes. So all this leads up to if I could have traded places with a single person on planet Earth, it'd be you. Right. Because you dated my boyfriend. I was engaged to your boyfriend. You guys were engaged. Yeah. This is like 90s. <sighs> 90s wow. uh, and what's back. so 90s brad pitt too. oh yeah. my oh god my the height god. of his superpowers 
Although he's doing very well. In yeah, his, yeah, of course. Yeah. He's great. He's mm. a really good person. And he's what's, a wonderful guy. But what's counterintuitive about him, and I'm not revealing anything. You said this on Stern. And I know a couple other of his ex-girlfriends from that period. And what all of you are consistent in saying, which is so cute about him, is he's like, he's really into commitment, right? Like he, Very much so. Yeah. He wanted to get married, right? Mm-hmm. Like he was ready to go do it. Yeah. And you were young. I was too young. I mean, I was 22 when I met him. Oh, Oof. my goodness. <laughs> I know. Baby. And it, you met him in Monica and I's third favorite movie of all time, Seven. Well, is that where oh. you met him? Yeah, that's where I met him. We love that movie so much. It's a good Gwyneth. movie. It is a good oh movie. Oh, my God. Do, is it good? Do you love yeah. it? I do love it. I mean, it's quite disturbing. But it's a really good movie. I like all of David Fincher's movies. I do too. And when you were, because I've asked you no acting questions, which you probably Please don't. prefer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to know, I, I have a singular question about acting, which okay. is what I know about David Fincher is he does like 90 takes or he can do up. That was of 90. not the case in Seven. Oh, it wasn't? Really? Not at all. Oh, wow. It was like two or three takes. I think this is some, I mean, maybe War I'm now? just really fucking good. I think that might be it. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it was something he developed later, but it was totally no, in the normal realm of takes. It was like not 90. Yeah. I, would, I genuinely would throw myself off a building if there were 90 takes. Like, I... I, I well, now for a different reason, right? Like, so what I, what I was curious about is initially, if, if, if I had to do 90 takes, my self-esteem and confidence would be so flattened that I'd be useless. There's no way I could act. Don't you think the first or second take is always the best anyway? For me, one's a throwaway. Like, aren't you a director? Yeah, yeah. Two and three for me. Two is, and it's, three. It's, that's okay. where it's at. And it's probably yeah. going to go downhill from there. I agree. I think I'm a, I think one is usually my best one. One or two. That's how Kristen is. Yeah. And she's flawless. I've directed her. Amazing. Right right away, she does the thing you're praying she'll do. Right. And you're like, why would I keep doing right. this? Right. Oh, so cool. But now it's evolved. So originally, it would have been my self-esteem would be crushed by that. But now, as someone who doesn't want to be at work, I want to be with my family, yeah. it, I, I would go mad yeah, doing yeah. 90 takes. No, I know. That would, that would be really tough. Yeah. So uh, basically, we need to get Brad Pitt and Jay-Z. So if it's like going to be, what's your next big birthday? Big one. 40? How old are you? God bless you, <laughs> GP. You, are you 40 yet? No, I turned 44 two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe for your 50th birthday. So we'll if, get them to jump out of a cake. Oh, oh my wow. God. And then you die, but it'd be okay. I would explode. It'd be the best way to go. Yeah. I'm just so excited that you made out with Brad and stuff. I did more than that. You? Oh my God, oh, you guys wow. did? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you heard it here first. <laughs> How, how all right so let's talk about current brad for one second okay because current current brad has a superpower too i know he really does so i met him at this party that we briefly discussed a minute ago and i find that it's it's very it, it it's more challenging than people would care to know to be with someone who is very famous and very well known and very that can be very it takes a special kind of guy i think to yeah. have his ego right to be able to take the back seat to his more known famous wife or partner. Right. And in I meet this Brad guy and I am as drawn to him as I would have been talking to Chris. Like I met you when you and Chris were a couple. I don't think I ever talked to Chris really, but I got sucked into Brad's retractor beam and I was like, oh, this guy ain't sweating it at all. He's got all kinds of charisma and charm, and he's very hyper intelligent. Yeah. And I, I think I talked to him for like forty five minutes. Yeah, you guys were deep in it. We got into it. We got into the weeds, Gwyneth. I know he's a, he's a, an incredibly curious, completely non judgmental person, and it's such a good combo because you find yourself overhearing these conversations, and he's. Like, there's nothing small about any of the talk. It's like, how on earth are you getting this far with somebody? And it's just like the stuff that you want to know and that stays with you. And But that's my point. Like, I, I overheard part of the conversation. And, you know, that's what I was saying earlier, that it, it I had no idea at that point how that you had this incredible life and that you were dealing with all kinds of stuff, but that you were approaching masculinity, fatherhood, monogamy, sobriety in a really 
amazing way. It was very inspiring to hear you talk about all this stuff. And it was because I could, you know, his questions are, he asks really good questions. He asks incredibly good questions. And you're right. He, you immediately sense in him that his ultimate goal is not a conclusion or judgment. His ultimate goal is like knowing about you. Correct. Which brings me back. Did you momentarily major in anthropology? No, I wanted to. Oh, you wanted to. I wanted to. to, but I never got far enough. I quit college to try to be an actress. <laughs> it worked out. Did you, but you were going to UCSB? I was. Did you take great. an intro class with Shagnon? Mm, oh, wait. This is ringing up. Did you go to UCSB? I didn't. I went to UCLA and I majored oh. in anthropology. But oh I, God. the reason I majored in anthropology is probably at the time you were there, I was on a road trip visiting friends that went to school there and I sat in on Shagnon's intro to anthro. I think and I was in that. Oh my goodness. We may have been in the same class, <laughs> fucking classroom. <laughs> but he's the one who worked with the Yanomamo. He was down in right. in Brazil and t doing the green hallucinogenic and right. stuff and hitting people Amazing. in the heads with boards. I mean, it was such a tantalizing, exotic kind of life that guy had lived that I was like, ooh, this is what I want to study. I want to go to the jungle and wow. do drugs and stuff and hit each other with boards <laughs> and just get wild, you know? Oh my God. Okay. I have a question real quick. Yeah. Are you really private? Like, do you value privacy a ton? Or are you pr you kind of like open book? Or you feel like people are allowed in? Or are you just sort of a random yeah. question? But Great I think that's question. an interesting... I mean, I think, you know, by virtue of the fact that I'm a public person, there are private aspects of my life that have been in the public for... 20, 20 you know since my 22 year 20 whatever 22 years old and I think that there are things that I keep very private I don't like to put my children out into the public you know once in a while if it's someone's birthday or something like I'll include them in, in Instagram posts because they they love you know they want you know it's fun yeah. for them but we don't take them to premieres or anything like like we try to keep that very you know, reasonably private. But I do feel like a lot of things that I think people would consider really private, I, it's almost like my duty to share, you know, like the mistakes and the vulnerabilities. And I think that's sort of part of being a public person. It's like, so you kind of walk the gauntlet and a, a lot of other people can learn from your mistakes and your successes, your key learnings in, in life. So, yeah. well, I would even argue you, I, I, or at least I feel, I certainly feel this way about Kristen and I, where people have seemed to embrace us as a couple and they have, uh, some people have decided that that's kind of the North star of what one should be. And knowing that, I feel this deep obligation to go like, oh, God, by the way, it takes a shitload of work. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, it's it's not. I didn't find the one. I found someone I respected, and we made it the one together. Yeah. You know, I, I I it's I think it's incumbent upon you in a weird way when people look up to you to really kind of own your your defects and your blemishes, yeah. so that they're not measuring themselves against the Gwyneth Paltrow they see on the cover of a magazine, because that's that's a, just a dicey. Yeah right airbrushed whatever mm -hmm. to be a person in the public eye to the degree that I am and have been for all these years I don't think I'll truly understand what the purpose of it was and you know for a long time but there must be some purpose to it because mm -hmm. I'm here and this is my life and I'm impacting people's lives and in, in ways they like and don't like and I'm starting conversations and you know, triggering people and yeah. resonating with people. And it's like, wow, okay, well, this is something like God put me here for something. I'm just gonna, I guess, like, keep being true to myself and doing my thing. And maybe one day I'll understand like the in a greater context, what the point of it was. Well, what I like about your thing is it's not like you're telling us you haven't dedicated your life to the best rental car company in the world. Like you're clearly <laughs> what you're putting out is the things that you genuinely are super interested in yeah. right like you're very interested in food i'm very interested in people having autonomy over their lives and optimization and all of the tools that are out there to help people and what so, does it mean to have autonomy over your life like for example you know i think f for a lot of women specifically there's been this 
thing in the culture of like, I don't, I don't feel well, something's wrong. And doctors are like, you're fine. And this is like, this is a, a recurrent theme that we've heard over and over again. There's nothing in your blood work. You're fine. No, genuinely, I'm telling you like something's off. I don't feel well. I don't know what it is. I think that, you know, we at Goop, we say, we try to say, hey, like there are a lot of ways that there are a lot of questions you can ask. And it can be about food, relationship, health, wellness, f- fashion, anything. And going back to shame, like nothing eliminates shame, like opening a forum to say, it's just okay to ask this question. So whether it's about sexual health, whether it's about, you know, eating or not eating lectins or whatever, it's like, let's just create a space where we can ask the questions. And we get really fascinated by some of the more alternative therapies or modalities or approaches to things Mm -hmm. because we think, you know, when we see maybe there's not like a double blind placebo backed study on acupuncture, but you can see like anecdotally, wow, I couldn't get pregnant. And then I started acupuncture and now I'm pregnant, you know, like there are those really interesting. So people can think acupuncture, is bananas or they can think, wow, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence here that it really helps people. Also, the cost of experimenting with something isn't that high. It's like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't, so I have psoriatic arthritis. I tried every single Western option known to man. And my wife's like, I'm sending you to an Ayurvedic healer to do the uh, Panchakarma cleanse. I'm like, that's horse shit. It's whatever. I went and did it. Lo and behold, my joints didn't hurt. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I've got to acknowledge that that really happened. The body is a, has amazing capacity to heal itself. Now, I do want to ask right. you this. So we had this great uh, doctor on here, uh, Dr. Wendy Mogul. Have you ever heard of her? She yeah. wrote Value of a Skin Knee or yep. Blessing of a Skin Knee. Super fascinating woman. And she said that in absence of religion, and she's not a shill for religion, it's not like she's pro-religion, that often you see a pattern where people start getting religious about food. Mm-hmm. And my wife was listening to the episode and she goes, oh my God, I so have what Wendy was saying. Right. Like, I've made food my religion. Yeah. And with it comes like this weird propensity towards shame and toxifying and detoxifying, all these things that are really kind of religious concepts of wow. purity and sin. And it, it just, it, it maps God, quite beautifully onto our kind of, inherent you know in our dna we have a propensity for religion like it's part of our evolution so do you ever say to yourself oh hmm i might also just be like that thing might be filling that Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that look what is the point of religion it's to give a context to this thing of being human Mm -hmm. like we want there to be meaning behind our suffering we don't just want to be abjectly suffering mm-hmm. we want to be getting somewhere we want we want to believe that you know when we do something good it has there's a butterfly effect to that like it has ramifications i think it's a very human feeling to want to feel interconnected mm-hmm. and to assign a context to our lives and so i think that's what religion does and perhaps in this modern era other things are able to offer us context yeah so how do you proceed through it and and weed out the other religious aspects so it's like i i myself feel this way because i have a very specific diet i should eat if i don't want my joints to swell up right and when i do it it works pretty darn good and then when i don't do it have you ever talked to seamus mullen by the way no he's a chef in new york he had crazy rheumatoid arthritis and was on like a million steroids and couldn't get off the floor and then he got addicted to painkillers and he went on this whole kind of guy i know yeah i that's what you would really (laughs) like him and he went on this whole healing journey and he really healed himself with food and he's a fascinating guy i should put you guys together when he's here yeah i would like that you're a bit of a connector like in that uh yeah would you call yourself very that? much so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i get even a, like yeah i've gotten emails from you going you're going to this thing basically i get the thrill out of that my know? wife is very similar yeah. she's like a facilitator of people to it's nice it, yeah it's a cool mm-hmm. again what are your self-esteem builders my self-esteem builders i mean i i think that the 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 factors that have impacted my self-esteem most are my relationship with my husband and my children. Mm-hmm. Like 
when I see them free to be themselves and, you know, singing when they think nobody's listening and like their, their baseline, like, of course, life is really hard and there are ups and downs and they have, you know, sad days and whatever, but their baseline is like, I'm so happy with their baseline. Uh huh. When all is said and done, like they're, they're in a, they, they start at a good place, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that says to me like, Hey, I haven't totally botched this up. Right. Like the values that I try to instill in them and Chris as well, you know, trying to make an atmosphere of home and love and support and non-judgment and being not parenting out of instinct, but parenting out of like, okay, who am I trying to put into the world and how can I do that? Yeah. And when you get little indications that like it might be working, I think it's, it feels great. How you about know? when they're nice to each other? Is there a greater feeling in the world? No. Oh, it is the greatest. When they're kind to one another and no oh, one's watching, if I you know. like catch it through a window. And it doesn't happen that often. No, they're <laughs> assholes in general. I mean, they are not, <laughs> we're not born nice. Boy, we got to be civil. Like, we got to go through the, the, <laughs> the grinder to get that way. My very last question, if you don't okay. mind me asking. I also just, I want to say, because I do think it's important, but yeah. I think like, I think sexuality is a good is like when you feel free in your sexuality, it's a very good self-esteem builder. Mm, Tell me more literally what that means. I just mean like if you can, like it's such a specific space to be in, right? Mm -hmm. Like having sex with your partner. Yeah. And to, I think to be in that space and to be who you really are and to be seen and not judged for that, Mm -hmm. like I think that is a universal self-esteem builder yeah i agree and it's so required for connection and maintenance and all that and i i do think that the sexual component of a relationship is by far the hardest to maintain over time right 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 because it requires vulnerability about the thing generally we're all most fearful of like are we enough do we fulfill the person we'd like to fulfill it's it it requires the the most heightened sense of vulnerability, I think, which generally is why people will put it off or not deal with it. Right. And it's so easy for that thing to break down and just so hard to repair. Yes, that is such a good point. And that was basically my my last question was just simply, what did you enter into your marriage with Brad going? I'm going to do this aspect right this time. Like what is this, this time I'm going to, I got another shot at it. Yeah. Cause I did this with Kristen. I was very conscious of like, I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. Right. I think this time what I'm, the intention that I've set is God, how do you even say this? This is a good question, Dax. I think that my, I have made a full commitment to, the extreme or through the extreme fear and vulnerability to find true intimacy and to stick with it. And I couldn't handle it last time. I wasn't ready to deal with all of the unhealed stuff that would come up through just like unbroken eye contact with somebody Mm -hmm. and, you know, both literally and metaphorically like somebody observing me fully as I see you and I'm observing this and like having to face what I hadn't healed yet, which real intimacy was bringing up. And like, I was always a person who was oscillating through relationships and I had a lot of walls up that I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't natural to be fully accountable for that stuff. And, you know, you can always blame, it's so easy to blame your partner. Like, Oh, Oh, I'm fine. I'm ready for this. Like, look at that maniac who's doing X, Y, and Z, you know? And the truth is like, you have chosen that person for whatever reason. And a lot of times we choose people that we can hide behind and I've chosen somebody. It's very hard for me. And I'm sure it's even harder for other people to imagine that you would have insecurities. Oh my God. I, I 
I, I had so many. I mean, I think this is one of the beautiful things about a woman post 40 is like at a certain point, you're like, fuck it. Uh-huh. Like, I'm going to be who I am. Yeah. I'm not going to look in the mirror and be so critical of everything. And I'm not going to, you know, rehash every mistake I've ever made in my life and flagellate myself for it. Like, I really did feel when I turned 40, I could feel a real shift. And I was like, I'm not going to do that anymore because I was ruled by my insecurities and like by the idea that I was unlovable. And I kept just trying to prove that out. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so crazy to imagine you having those fears, but it, we all have them. It's the human existence. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. And, and do you, God damn it. I just, I had one thing. I got to let you go, but wait, I just have to ask yeah, the yeah. same question. So like what, having now been in this intimate relationship for all these years, mm-hmm. what is the most profound lesson that you get from being married? The thing that I think I, I can't speak for Kristen, but I can speak for myself, which is I now I've learned to 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 recognize the, the difference between an annoyance and an actual issue. Right. So I'm not going to like the fact that Kristen doesn't close cupboard doors. She doesn't put the tops on things. There's all kinds of things that are going to annoy me about her. I do that too. I can tell I now have a great radar system that when we start debating something, and it can be innocuous. It can be about some topic, whatever. If I can feel in my chest, I'm mm-hmm. starting to get heated and my, my, my breathing starting to get constricted and my, my nostrils are starting to flare. I now say to myself, oh, she just hit a fear. And I will say to her, hey, please let me pause. I'm going to go in the room for 10 minutes and I'm just going to kind of think through mm-hmm. what fear is actually being triggered because I don't think it's about the cupboard doors. That's and so I evolved. go to a room and I go, man, because because what I now know about myself intrinsically is that if I'm passionate about it, there's a fear at the bottom of it because otherwise I just don't care. In general, I, I don't care if I, it's not triggering a fear of mine. And then right. I know my fears are my problem. They're not her problem. But I can then come back and I can go, you know, when you said you want to go to Africa and help these people, I went back to my mom had a job that required a lot of her attention and her time. And I wanted all that attention and time. And there was something in the house that was more important than me. And that was work. And I think because this is for good, you helping people in Africa, that that's going to be more important than me. And I don't want anything to be more important than me. I don't want to be second ever again. And she can then Instead of us debating about whether the fucking charity is going to yield results or not, she can look at me and go, I will not go if you say don't go. You are number one and you will always be number one. And if I just hear it, now I go, have a blast in Africa. I know, exactly. It's so fucking stupid and elementary. I think you should write a book. It'd be a short one because I just told you my whole premise in like <laughs> twenty seconds. But anyways, yeah, I just, I guess, I guess my yeah, my message to people would be basically in relationships when things are getting heated, that's a great, great time for you to take a look at what fear is being triggered because just so important for husbands to hear that. Yeah, yeah, you're very, you really are very evolved, Dax. Well, thank you so much. I think you are too. And you don't trigger me at all. You make me feel good. (laughs) And I look at the things you put out into the world and I go, oh, this person just love. I love watching someone explore things they love. I watch documentaries about hand gliders. I'm not going to hand glide, but I go, wow, look at this person. They're expressing this thing they're committed their life to. And I look at you and I go, this is awesome. I don't agree with half the stuff you're saying. I'm never going to eat like you, but I'm delighted to witness you be on fire for something. Thanks for joining my conversation with Dak Shepard today. I loved talking to him and I hope you enjoyed it as well. To hear more from Dax, just tune into his podcast, Armchair Expert. Again, we're so grateful that you tuned in to the Goop podcast today, and we hope you'll be back soon. We have a new episode coming on Thursday. As always, we'd love to know what you think. So please rate and review, share with a friend and hit subscribe. Head to goop.com slash the podcast for more info.